Act Three of The Princess Zubaroff by Ronald Furbank. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene One. Same scene. A few of the trees have shed their leaves. It is winter. Through the bare branches of the Judas tree, a cavalry is visible at the extremity of the garden. As the curtain rises, Nurse is seen strolling to and fro, exercising Baby in his pram. Angelo follows at her heels, singing strenuously to the guitar. Nurse and Infant, Angelo You young Italians are all passion. -la -la -la. Not so loud, you wake the child. She takes from the pram a flask of lacrima Christi and drinks. Sapristi! My favorite vintage, plenty of body. A che roba! Yes, you Italians are dangerous fellows. You make me think of Dudley, Lord Belfort's underbutler, long ago. Drinks. Ah, oh, I've been a buxom woman in my day, dear. A little bit of proper simpatico I was. And I'm good enough yet, honey. Some constitutions are just like this. Drinking. They improve with time. Falling into reflection. She was forty-nine years old when she had me, my dear mother. And then there were two after that. Angelo, shrugging. Que volete? Which is more than most of them could say, or do, your Tuscan signoras. I am not Tuscan myself at all. Strumming his guitar. My home is in the south. Ah, la bella taormina. Well, it's all south to me, dear. Angelo, shrugging. Per bacco. This is south, all right, for me. Returning flask to pram. Oh, dull is it? A deal. It's quiet enough, it's true. Now the mistress has gone. Povera. I like a place, I must say, where there's a bit of life. When I was with the honorary, Mrs. Cortez, there was company, if you like. Valets, chauffeurs, Parisian maids. Gracious powers, you could take your choice. It was in her establishment. I met my Albert. Albert? Mr. Mangrove, my sposo. She sighs several times, heavily. Angelo, with morbid interest. And was he tutto, tutto? Nurse, nodding. Tutto, tutto. That is to say, my dear, I never could bear him, but in the one capacity, for he never had any mind or any understanding. What was he? Snaps her fingers. But that. Ah. Nurse, archly winking. But in the one capacity, love, he was unexcelled. Baby begins to require attention. Enter Reggie from roadway. Scene two. Same. Reggie. Reggie, dapper, smiling. I blew in only to say good morning to little Charles. That's very kind of you, sir. Raising baby. Sit up and say good morning to Mr. Quintus. He's a fine child, nurse. He's a little beauty, sir, as I'm his sainted nanny. They won't have him inside a convent, heaven protect us, for fear he'd flurry the nuns. Will you kiss me, Charles? Kiss the gentleman. That's right. See how he's laughing. The rogue. I fear he's a rogue, nurse. He's a fine fellow. No morals. He has no morals, I fear. Oh, why, sir? Why now? Born in Florence, a boy very rarely has. Don't be hard on Florence, Mr. Quintus. It's not near so fast, I'm sure, as San Francisco. I wonder... Ah, America. Still keen as ever on visiting the States. Angelo, 
with all the languor of the south yes oh yes reggie twinkling mysteriously before you go i must give you a letter of introduction to a multimillionaire who's rather a friend of mine in memphis tennessee tanti grazie niente the bell tinkles murmuring his gratitude angelo answers the garden gate after which he exits to house enter from roadway blanche scene three same blanche she looks hot and dishevelled she bears a sack she is dressed as a nun she gives one the impression rather of an escaped peacock blanche dropping her sack they sent me to wait here with the victuals oh out at monte Saravizza, there isn't a thing what are they coming up to the via today yes nurse on hearing this intelligence briefly withdraws the whole cottage blanche seating herself mopping her brow we came into florence shopping or begging god knows which a bit of both i expect my wretched nerves has baccio bertucci been baccio bertucci he promised what it can't be helped i suppose we must go without your abbess i'm told is quite scoring as a saint Shh, who said it the rock towers life at monte Saravizza is quite indescribable it must be wonderful it's nothing but backbiting from morning to night oh the violence of religious jealousy i know of nothing at all that can match it violence zena's becoming much too tyrannical reggie perching himself on a garden chair remember these small sublunar trails will one day pass i hope so i'm sure poor mrs negress today as we were coming into florence i arranged my side hair experimentally and she was furious what are you doing with those whiskers she said to me i won't have any whiskers here arousing our thoughts oh while her head was scrubbed but yesterday with henna she was shampooed you say with henna blanche stalking up and down swaying her skirts from side to side like a spanish dancer and only the day before she ordered herself a crystal cincture from paris reggie tossing his hat ole ole thoughts indeed nobody can do outrageous things so naturally as she can i admit she's clever she hushed up the affair of may winterbottom most successfully there's been a scandal a scandal the very night the first new novice arrived well zena smelt smoke heavy smoke all the corridors full of it coming from the sister's cell she went to her door and oh the horror what may winterbottom was smoking opium Poof. yes Reggie, rising carelessly. If the princess should want a pin to reach you for a chapel, by the way, I know where there's one to be found. Indeed. In your cannon. Oh. Oh, I know of a topping to threat. Thanks, but I fancy she's on the scent of a Santa Famille herself. I give a good deal for a permit of inspection. Uh, there's no bathroom yet in the convent. You just get caught in the rain disgusting blanche with a battered smile one of the few drawbacks reggie looking at his watch well i must go i have to meet lord orkish in the town exit reggie through garden gate re-enter at same moment nurse from house perhaps you'd prefer mum to rest inside i'm quite happy here you don't look so mum no the religious life it's not for everybody no nurse confidential she tried to coax me into it but i didn't feel the call my work was over in the world you see i had nothing to fight for to enid who enters i thought you were never coming scene four enter from roadway enid 
followed by Nadine and Princess. Nadine runs to Baby's pram. Princess, she holds a tortoiseshell cat, like an unhappy society woman, in her arms, hovers a moment, speaking to someone outside the gate. They look very pale, slim, and Isis-like in their grain-colored nun's toilettes. Enid, coming down. Sorry to be late, old girl. Old girl? We've been getting ribbons for Monte, such a subtle old flowered velvet, and yards and yards and yards of green Georgette. Blanche, aggrieved, staring at her sack. What for? Decoration. Today, as a special treat, we're going back by auto. Hallelujah! Did you do all my little commissions? All except the candles. Tiresome. You look hot. My face must be a looking-glass. Not that. Had that dreadful sack weighed much more, I think I should have fainted. Princess, a little guilty, excusing herself. My dear, I'm desolate you should have had to carry it at all about the streets. But what could I do? Blanche, containing herself. Reggie Quintus has just gone. Really? And I had wanted to see him. He was telling me of a Tintoret or something. Enid, nodding. He's rather a judge. Nadine, leaning over Pram, sorrowfully, to her son. My poor pigeon, I warn you to expect nothing very much from life. What makes her so oppressed? She's chagrined a little because I said her habit made her look hunched. Distorted, and so it does. And she was dreaming again of Adrian. Once I get a decent cook, she'll not have these nightmares. Blanche draws away a little, joining Nadine. I am so glad I'm not haunted with Eric. Princess, angelic, virtuous. May white dreams attend you always, dear. Amen. Amen. Princess, catching marvelously her breath, as if her spirit, freed, had shot from earth to heaven, and from heaven back again to earth. <sighs> Blanche seems nervy today. Princess, fluttered, breathless yet. Yes, unstrung. She says she feels jumpy. Princess, with sudden brusqueness. Can you wonder her nerves are what they are when she's sipping alternative coffee and tea from seven in the morning to twelve at night? Enter from house, Lady Rock Tower. Scene five. Same, Lady Rock Tower. She looks slightly embarrassed. Her face is a trifle red. She is wearing the family pearls. She has a hole in her veil. I saw you go by and guessed you'd be here. Enid retreats. Princess, kissing her a la Santa Therese. Mm, mm, my dear Lady Rocktower. Lady Rocktower, clutching her pearls. I've come only to know if, dear, by any chance, you could take my daughter in. Princess, stiffening. Take her in. Receive her. As a novice? For a time. I fear she'd not be happy at Monte Seravizza. I fear our austerities, our rule, everything. Glider's so difficult and so giddy, and it's precisely for that. Princess, ethereal, exquisite. I was once heedless, too. I would like to marry my daughter straight from your convent door. Marry her? Well... Un grand mariage. Princess, reassured a little. But could one manage her? I'm sure you could, and, oh, I should be so grateful. From what you say, I gather she's given her heart to someone. Lady Rocktower, making a clean breast of it. Poor child, she thinks herself in love with a young Italian lieutenant. Though I thank God on my knees, dear Zena, she has scarcely caught a glimpse of his shadow. You're certain of that? Positive. 
I'll come over one morning and have a quiet chat with Glider. She and I, quite cosy. <laughs> Although, really, I'm most awfully busy at present with my liqueur. What liqueur? I'm inventing a delightfully potent liqueur to be made by the nuns. The Holy Father... Rippling. Was quite charmed with the few distilled drops I sent. He pretends... He pretends it will inspire him for life. Yes? We mean to call it Yellow Ruin. I had an audience, my fifth, only the other day. My dear, you're always trotting to Rome. I adore it in winter. Is there lots and lots going on? The usual thing. There's been a function at the Quirinal which was dull, and another at the Embassy which was worse, and, apropos of recent diplomacy, Lady Winifred Wheeler has just presented Sir Walter Wheeler with a black child. Such a commotion as there's been over it all. Princess, horror-struck. Black? Well, dear, dark, but, oh, so dark. <laughs> and the de Wilsons are just starting a nursery, too. Poor little Violet. She made me such a wan, sensitive smile in the street just now. She seems to think she should be asked to paint herself for the Uffizi. <laughs> really, I never saw such cheeks. No, nor I. Laughing, going. Look in Thursday at the villa, if you're able. Sonino is singing. Sonino? Oh, when Sonino sings, one visualizes everything one wishes. She is to throw in her sob of love and sing three solos for a special charge. It's hard indeed to refuse, but we never go out at night. This once. Oh, and I nearly forgot. I wanted to ask you for that choice receipt. Coxcombs? And the hearts of artichokes. Lady Rocktower, smiling, committing it to memory. And the hearts of artichokes. Crush well. A more delicious dish. You must give it me when I come to you, the days I visit Glider. Princess, leaning on Lady Rocktower's arm and accompanying her towards the gate. I'm allowing the novices on feast days to receive their friends in a charming cognac chiffon. You all look so interesting as it is. Princess, very much pleased. Do we? I almost envy you. Dear Lady Rocktower, perhaps some day. Lady Rocktower, as she goes out. Who knows? A husband's often a strain, and mine's not a world-loving nature very. Scene six. Same, minus Lady Rocktower. Nadine advancing. During Lady Rocktower's visit, she has withdrawn from view behind a tree. And how has he kept nurse all the week? Well as could be. Thank you, ma'am. Poor spirit. Oh, he's a little rascal. His little laugh does one good. He's a remarkably hideous child like a remarkably hideous duck. Princess, Abyssish. Prioress, Prioress. Enid, dancing mischievously about the pram. Whoever had such a wobbly chin, or such a nervous, uncertain nose? He's like his father. Ugly, ugly, like Papa. Where's Daddy? Enter, from Garden Gate, Adrian and Eric. They both are looking wonderfully recouped and rejuvenated, as though their extensive holiday has done them good. Which has benefited from his freedom most, which looks the handsomer, is not easy to determine. When he starts pummeling the air with his little pinky-winky fists, with his little dimpled doigets, whatever can it be, I know he wants something. Probably his father. Slow music. A short intermezzo of a particularly cloying nature coming from the orchestra concludes the scene. Scene 7. Same. Adrian, Eric. Nadine. The intermezzo ended, very calmly, through the hood of the pram. Oh, Adrian, so you have come back. 
as you see enid to eric you might have given us a sign drian's benel we were unwilling to alarm you enid with biting satire alarm us do you remember how scared you were in egypt once i can't say i do there's no use to cut up rough you're unwanted quite unwanted princess interposing your wives are dedicated i beg your pardon enid to nadine don't they jar eric catching her by the veil lord loomy what's this don't touch me that's as i choose enid freeing herself oh the horrid man he hit me he hit you sacrilege enid smacking eric smartly with her rosary ah monster nurse panting well i never angelo appears nadine crucified Shh. avoid a sena before the servants hey oh this is awful angelo announcing the alto enid quietly threatening him with her scourge oh eric don't exasperate me more nadine with the upturned glance of a martyr i refuse to wrangle princess in violet evoking cavalry come enid doing a little picturesque skirmishing beast the bitch bit me blanche picking up her sack and making for the gate my knees refuse to carry me yes let's go as you please nurse to nadine i wish to give warning very well princess to nadine and enid come cheeks mind the step zena princess turning defiantly at gate the vatican shall hear of this excellent princess nadine and enid scene eight adrian eric adrian dropping into a chair i thought perhaps we should find they'd remarried or something but i'll be cursed if i thought they'd console themselves as they have eric at pram the boy must be yours adrian blushing confused i suppose i'm his father what on earth are you going to do with the little beggar i shall look out for a school for him to-morrow uh, no really adrian i shall set at once about his education eric bending over pram isn't he just too fat for anything the outside bell is heard to ring what's that oh my god if they should have returned re-enter angelo he saunters languidly over to garden door voice of lord orkish off i must have missed mr quintus and i know he comes here most days to play with the child voice of angelo off the master has come home lord orkish entering what scene nine same lord orkish adrian surprised henry lord orkish considerably moved proffering his hand my dear dear fellow henry under the peculiar circumstances they very nearly all embrace lord orkish wonderstruck and how amazingly fit you look you seem to have grown much younger eric smiling we've had a top hole time drian was seedy though at first nothing at all to speak of i refuse to let him die adrian nodding eric soon nursed me round and your estimable wives you've heard of them of course yes and seen them too what's more they must have passed you they went off in a taxi a snug half dozen what they've gone they've left you apparently 
It's all I can do to believe it. Lucky chaps. Delicious to be so dispossessed. Lord Orkish, leering a little. Well, they're not the first to come to Florence to turn themselves into prudes. As you very well know, dear Harry. I take it you'll live apart, as we do, Lady Orkish and I, by mutual consent. Yes, uh, mutual consent. No odious fuss. I hope not. I assure you, after the first day, I never missed Bella. Eric, stretching luxuriously his arms. Oh, to be free, to be single. Adrian, addressing rapturously the garden. Dear Lorn, my own beautiful trees. He's enchanted to be home. Ah, <sighs> well, there's no spot on earth to compare with Florence. The outside bell is heard to ring again. Angelo answers it as before. Enter a tiny boy in buttons. He has with him a faggot of huge church candles. Scene 10. Same. Angelo. Boy. Angelo, having ascertained the boy's business, to Adrian. He come from the church furnishers in Borgo Santi Apostoli. From where? From Bacio Bertucci's. Adrian, sharply, to boy. Be off with you. He say the signora ordered the candles. Tell him to hook it. Angelo, clapping his hands. A Monte Seravizza, laggiù. Eric, pointing, in desperation. Laggiù, laggiù. Via, via. Lord Orkish, patting the child's head. Run away. There's a good little sinner. Excellent boy, followed by Angelo. Scene 11. Lord Orkish, Eric, Adrian, infant, then Angelo. The Eleusinian priestesses weren't in it. Have you formed yet any plans? I shall stop here. It will amuse me infinitely to see what they'll do. I shouldn't wonder much if they weren't back in Lewis hats and diamonds before tonight. Eric, terrified at the idea. Oh, don't. If Enid puts in an appearance again, I shall take the first express to Rome. You're safe enough, Eric. Enid has no ties. No ties? Adrian, with a touch of conceit. She isn't a mother. It must take an exceptionally good woman to forsake husband, son, friends, society to follow the way of the cross. It's quite on the cards that Nadine was only bored. Besides, she hasn't deserted her friends at all. I believe, but for Princess Zuboroff, she'd be here now. The princess seems to have fairly bewitched them. Lord Orkish, humming pensively to himself. <laughs> With a hey-ho-hey -hey and an ani. You're right. I wish she'd rake in Bella. Perhaps she will. And the old white cat. What old white cat? The Countess Willie. The baby begins to fidget. Adrian, wheeling the pram about. Shh, shh, maddening. I'd like to know what you'll do with him. Tomorrow he goes to school. Does he? By George. Well, I always believe in a boy getting used to the world as soon as possible. To be duly prepared. I know of an incomparable little Lycée here in Florence. Ah, uh, incomparable instructors, incomparable boys. Incomparable, incomparable. Everything incomparable. I dare say. Just the thing. Whereabouts is it, Harry? Via Canta, a vermilion gold brick palace in the very heart of the town. Adrian, bending over Pram with smiling raillery. We're probably very backward. We probably know nothing at all. The baby howls. Re enter Angelo. E pronto il pranzo. You'll stay, pranz, Harry? Thanks. 
Adrian, menacingly to Baby. Stop it. And you shall play us each at pills after, what? I hope the nuns haven't injured the cloth. The bell rings violently. Eric, paralyzed. Oh, my God. If it should be... The garden gate opens slightly. A handful of leaflets falls inside. Confetti? It's only a circular. Oh, I thought it was Enid. I wouldn't worry. So long as the princess chooses, she'll not leave the sisterhood, I'll be bound. I sincerely hope you're right. Lord Orkish, chuckling to himself. And she'll guard her close, believe me. Eric, to Angelo, who has picked a leaflet up. What's it all about? Angelo, thrilling, with exultation, as though what he read was for him an article of faith. Oggi cinema reale grande representazione sapfo gli amanti di mitelene adrian with a gesture of impatience oh throw it away angelo perusing still his whole face alight la bella courtesane la pompadour una assassina d'amore la vita di londra Adrian, with the pram moving towards the house, followed by Eric and Lord Orkish. By the by, I don't even know my child's name. He gives me the impression rather of a Hermione. Hermione? Nonsense, Eric. He has an air of Claude, or Gervais, even. Gervais? Adrian, to baby. Hello, Gervais. His name's Charles. Charles? Charles Augustus Frederick Humphrey Percy Sidney. I intend calling my son Gervais. Why not Jerry? No, Gervais. Jerry. Excellent. Jerrying and Gervaisying one another to house. Angelo, still perusing the leaflet, dawdling, in tones of sheerest ecstasy and joy. La pompadour. La vita dolar. Looking like some statue of Verrocchio, he raises his arms yearningly, murmuring, Dolar, dolar, la vita dolar. As the curtain falls. End of Act Three. End of The Princess Zubaroff by Ronald Furbank.